Hi, I'm going to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Rick Baker. I've been a professor here for 18 years. Um, through all these years, I have met a few students that are sitting here right now that have showed extraordinary qualities in their academic performance. Brianna Weibel is one of these. She has taken several classes from me, English 203, which would be major themes in literature, also English 312, which would be my world literature class, and presently she's in my English 495 uh, senior seminar class. She has a penchant for existentialism, which is my field of expertise. Um, so much so that she has written a paper for me that I thought uh, you would enjoy. It's all about uh, an author by the name of Miguel de Unamuno, who has written a novella, really, called Saint Emmanuel the Good Martyr. And um, after he wrote this piece, um, he was proclaimed a heretic by the Catholic Church and then kicked out. So uh, these are always, these banned book ideas are always really good topics. And so she will then present to you a paper that she has written on uh, Miguel de Unamuno, Saint Emmanuel the Good Martyr, and Existentialism. Without further ado, Brianna Roybal. Hello, everybody. <laughs> well, I hope none of you have had your existentialist crisis for the day because I'm about to give you one. And, uh, but it's okay, we're gonna go through it together. All right, so I did my paper on Saint Emmanuel the Good Martyr. And it was just one of those books that kept me up all night and I just had to figure this book out. And I thought that uh, existentialism would provide the best um, means for me to do that because of the re religious themes in it. Um, so here's Miguel de Unamuno. Uh, as Dr. Baker said, he was excommunicated after writing this book. I think he looks a little like Freud if you ask me. <laughs> uh, so just a quick recap about what the book is all about. The main characters are Don Manuel, who is a, a priest who does not believe in the afterlife. He and Angela and Lazarus are the only other people who know this about him. The story takes place in the fictional town of Alverde de Lucerna, which is a fictional town in Spain. Um, he lies to the entire town and claims that he believes in the afterlife and he preaches to them to also believe and fills his days doing priestly things and helping people to die well, as the book says, and all those good things. Uh, these are a couple of different cover arts from the novel. This is an interpretation of what maybe the town of Lucerna might have looked like. This middle one is uh, one of my favorites because it depicts the inner turmoil that uh, Don Manuel seems to feel because those are the two things that are always bearing down on his shoulder, his fate or his faith and his religion. It's almost like a second cross to bear. Alright, so I'm gonna try <laughs> and give you guys a real fast crash course <laughs> in existentialism before I start uh, showing how it's applied in the uh, book. So <sighs> There are two philo ph <coughs> philosopher, philosophers' interpretations that I relied heavily on in my examination of San Manuel Guadalmartyr. Um, most of the existential, existentialist framework we'll be discussing today was from Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy. This, this guy over here. What is this? What is this book? Okay. Well, that guy <laughs> over there. <laughs> um, the yeah, the guy in the far left. Uh, I did use a particular uh, piece, <laughs> a framework from Soren Kierkegaard, who's considered to be the father of existentialism, despite how young he looks in this picture. Um, I chose these two specifically because Sartre is an atheist, and Kierkegaard was a Christian. He was a Lutheran, and he had no problems marrying existentialism and um, religion together, which is very awesome because not everybody can. Hear. Okay, it doesn't like me now. All right, so here are some tenets, or the tenets of existentialism. There's a focus on the individual as a conscious being, meaning that um, you as an individual exist before your 
Hmm. You exist before you can define yourself. You think, therefore you are, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, the individual is a conscious being, meaning that he or she is aware of him or herself. The consciousness is the basis for an individual's thoughts, feelings, actions, and essence. An individual is nothing before he or she defines him or herself. If my existence precedes my essence, if I must exist in the world before I can define myself, then I am responsible for what I make of my life. So existential works of literature focus on the cognitive experiences of an individual and how he or she interacts and builds relationships with others. Moral subjectivity. What is right or wrong for one individual may or may not be right or wrong for another individual. We are individually responsible for ourselves. There are no moral absolutes. <coughs> Excuse me. There are no, there is no black and white. There is no right or wrong. There is only gray. Lots and lots of gray. <coughs> and the reason for all this gray differs from philosopher, <laughs> from philosopher, uh, especially between Sartre and Kierkegaard. Um, and may or may not include a God figure, especially between Sartre and Kierkegaard. The third is choice. Life is a series of choices. Even refusing to choose is still making a choice. So my life is made up of the choices that I make. Uh, the fourth is freedom and responsibility. And this one is a real big one. Uh, this is the burden of humankind. We have to accept the responsibility for the choices we make. We've, our choices that we have made have constructed our lives and our very identities. There are consequences attached to those decisions. For instance, if I choose to assault my hairdresser's hair with her own scissors because she's botched my own haircut, I have to deal with the, with the consequences of that decision, namely arrest, assault charges, mm -hmm you know, trial and probably contempt of court because of the snarky remarks I made to the judge. <laughs> but <laughs> I cannot blame the hairdresser for the assault I committed on her <laughs> for, based on the ability, her inability to cut my hair. I chose to assault her. And in doing so, I became a hairdresser batterer. The fifth is usually yeah, okay. the fifth is usually dread and anxiety. But as I read more about existentialism, I realized that dread, anxiety, and anguish are only symptoms to an existential disease, if you will, um, of alienation and bad faith that create this system or experience called the existential crisis. The crisis is this: I exist until I am dead. And since there is death, does my life matter? And ladies and gentlemen, the, que the answer to that is only if you make it matter. We are free to do anything we wish, morally speaking, because there are social realities that prevent us from flying to Jamaica on a moment's notice. But we can be anything we desire, construct any reality and identity we choose. Assault hairdressers if the fancy takes us. I didn't say they were all great freedoms, but we are free to exist as we choose. This freedom is a great and terrible thing. It's possibility, opportunity, and tremendous responsibility. Accepting this responsibility and seeking authenticity rather than submitting to self-deception as a means to cope with that responsibility is called good faith. I am aware of, my, of the impact that my decisions have made on my life and my identity, and I accept responsibility for that. <clears throat> oh, let me dry in here. Conversely, <laughs> bad faith is self-deception, when one lies to oneself and believes it. Uh, it was the hairdresser that made me do it. it if only she had cut my hair the way I wanted her, I would not have had to attack her. Good and bad faith sound like obscure ideas. In fact, most of what I've been talking about sounds obscure and lacks a certain sort of physicality. But these ideas have such an impact on human consciousness 
that they physically manifest themselves in a body through dread, anxiety, and anguish. These terms tend to be used almost interchangeably in some texts, but during the course of my research, I've come to define them as separate experiences. We'll discuss them in greater detail in terms of how they affect Don Manuel. Those who suffer bad faith can and are encouraged to seek authenticity and therefore live in good faith. It's not easy, but that's the function of the existential crisis. <clears throat> it's the process by which an individual can gain good faith. The leap of faith is a concept credited to Soren Kierkegaard, our young-faced ex father of existentialism. It requires an individual to go ahead and believe or embrace something that he or she has no real knowledge or understanding of, whether it exists or not, um, and ultimately whether or not it's going to work out in the end. An individual must commit to this leap. Kierkegaard, for Kierkegaard, this is the highest point of individual freedom because one has made the subjective decision to commit to a belief, regardless of whatever objective evidence there may or may not have been. I include it here at the end of the existential crisis, which is based largely on Sartian concepts, only because it has a tremendous influence on the religious crisis that Don Manuel experiences. The leap of faith could be used as a means to embrace God, because he or she or it or whatever it is that you choose to personally believe is ultimately unknowable, unfathomable. And there are no real guarantees whether or not God's going to be there at the end of the day. But in building this personalized relationship and understanding with God, an individual is able to gain authenticity and good faith. <clears throat> now, where existentialism and religion tend to really butt heads, um, is over the need for moral subjectivity by existentialism and the need for moral absolutes by religion. Um, Sartre was an atheist, so his conception of existentialism was built around the absence of God. If there is no God, then there's no way to define what is moral and what is immoral. There are no guidelines to build your life along. We have to figure it out all on our own, and we only have ourselves to blame in the end if it blows up in our face. <coughs> there are no excuses, excuses or justifications for our lives. This freedom becomes oppressive. There are no moral boundaries, and there is no deity to shoulder this divine responsibility, because we are human and unable to fill the void left by an absent God. We struggle to shoulder this tremendous responsibility, so we suffer. Accepting this state of affairs is good faith. Organized religions tend to operate on moral absolutes. There is right and there is wrong. There is good, there is evil, there is God, there is the devil, there is virtue, there is sin. There is, but there is nothing... <coughs> violation of these moral absolutes usually results in eternal damnation. There is nothing unique about the relationship with God. We are all God's children and he loves us all equally. That's all well and good, but it doesn't work with the existentialist conception of individually, individuality and subjectivity because it's a mass-produced interpretation. This is God. This is who you are to God. This is the only way to God. <clears throat> but Kierkegaard, who was a devout Christian and saw nothing inconsistent with marrying faith and existentialism, he encouraged individuals to seek their true selves through faith by building a personal relationship with an understanding of God. It is important to note that he speci specified faith rather than organized religion because faith could be subjective. Uh, it was based on what an individual personally believed. All right, so now that you have this really quick horse-ish in <laughs> existentialism, let's take a look at how it works in San Manuel Buena Martyr. This is my little Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> Our individuals are, of course, San Manuel, Angela, and Lazarus. We are concerned only with them. The rest of the people, though they are extremely important to Don Manuel, act as a backdrop for the relationships between these three characters. Angela is the narrator 
and it is through her thoughts, feelings, observations, and perceptions that we are aware of Don Manuel's thoughts, feelings, and experiences. When she interacts with him, when he is speaking or confessing to her, or when she is hearing his confession secondhand through her brother Lazarus. <clears throat> San Manuel Bueno Martyr juxtaposes Sartre and Kierkegaard's concepts of moral subjectivity. Don Manuel is a faithless priest. He does not believe the things he preaches to his congregation every Sunday. He does not believe in moral absolutes that bind up the Catholic religion that he serves. At one point in the novel, Don Manuel is trying to convince Lazarus to take communion in order to ease the concerns of the town, regardless of how Lazarus personally feels about religion. When Lazarus questions the priest about true religion, Don Manuel says, as for true religion, all religions are true, as long as they give spiritual life to the people who profess them. Don Manuel has an atheistic Sartian view of the world, but chooses to live a life that might give spiritual meaning to others, which is a goal of Kierkegaard's philosophy. <coughs> Don Manuel was taught moral absolutes during his seminary when he became a priest, but does not believe in them because those absolutes lead back to a God in a world beyond his comprehension. Therefore, he cannot accept them. He sees the world as Sartre sees the world. There is no God, no afterlife. Then we are left alone and must figure out this existence on our own. He sees this and he suffers because of it. He constantly considers committing suicide because it is a possibility, one of the many he has in his world of moral freedom. <clears throat> there is nothing to stop him from taking his own life. God does not exist and therefore cannot judge him for his actions. Would committing suicide be such a bad thing? It would end his suffering. He tells Lazarus that his life is a kind of continual suicide or a struggle against suicide, which is the same thing. Though Don Manuel has adopted and accepted a Sartian existential view of the world, he is, close, he is close to living in good faith, but for one thing, he chooses to become a priest, to remain a priest, and to lie to the entire town of Lucerna about his personal beliefs. He dedicates his entire existence to helping others take a leap of faith, but refuses to take one himself. He is denying his own identity in favor of adopting a persona that helps him to cope with the oppressive freedom of existence. He has alienated himself by assuming this role. Now, Sark gives three different examples of bad faith, which is a woman on a date, a waiter, and a homosexual. Now, we're a little short on time, um, so I'm going to go ahead and explain the one that Don Manuel is, which is the waiter. Now, the waiter, <coughs> the waiter is in bad faith because he is only accepting one part of his identity. If you define things by what they are in relation to what they are not, identifying yourself is done in much the same way. You must accept your identity as being everything that you are and everything that you are not. The waiter is in bad faith because he is accepting only the part of his identity that defines him as a waiter. He works hard and puts on a show of pleasant manners and good service in order to convince those that he waits on that he is a good waiter but does not accept that though he is a waiter, he is also not a waiter. He's other things. Perhaps he's also a hairdresser. <laughs> he refuses responsibility because this is all that he is and he is a slave to it. Now Don Manuel keeps saying he is a priest. He acts, he looks, he speaks like a priest. He fills his days performing good deeds, helping the needy and praying over the dying. In fact, he is so good at pretending to be a priest that the church is considering making him a saint after his death. He cannot tell the people of Lucerna the truth because if he does, he will have to confront the responsibility of living a life without God. And he refuses to do that. 
Dread, anxiety, dread and anxiety are two words that are often used interchangeably in existential analysis and writing. However, certain small differences can be made between the two experiences which would give each a separate and unique definition. According to Kierkegaard, an individual is overcome with dread when the weighty responsibility of choice is placed upon his or her shoulders because his or her eternal salvation or damnation hangs in the balance. Dread is a precursor to choice. So when you have to make one of those like terrible weighty decisions and you really don't want to and you feel kind of sick, that's what it is. Anxiety, on the other hand, is strongly connected to Sartre's concept of nausea. After committing to a choice that has pushed the individual further from his or her own personal truth, the individual feels the resulting alienation so acutely that he or she feels nauseous. With, <coughs> where dread and is a precursor, anxiety is the after effect. Anguish is another term that is widely used and exchanged with dread and anxiety in existential writing. Ultimately, anguish is representative of the suffering one experiences when considering the oppressive freedom that an individual has in creating his or her reality. If nothing can compel or stop the individual, the possibilities are left entirely up to him or her. Don Manuel suffers constant anxiety and anguish. He became a priest in order to escape the anguish he felt in confronting a world of possibilities, but this decision alienated him and added anxiety to his suffering. He fills his days by doing good deeds to keep himself busy to prevent his idle mind from wallowing in his pain. In order for Don Manuel to escape bad faith, he can do one of two things. He can go ahead and come out and tell everybody the truth and therefore live an authentic life to himself, or he can take a leap of faith and go ahead and embrace that what he's been preaching to everybody. If he fully commits to embracing these beliefs, despite whatever evidence he feels negates them, he will exercise complete Kierkegaardian freedom in finding a truth that is true for him. He can build a unique relationship with God that will ultimately enable and the authenticity he needs to live in good faith. Unfortunately, Don Manuel is unable to do this. He cannot reveal the, the truth to the townspeople because it would destroy the peace in their lives. Don Manuel asserts that humankind must be consoled for having been born only to die, and faith has provided that comfort for many of the people in the town. He has lived his entire life tortured by anguish because he cannot believe as the people of Lucerna do. He cannot take away what little peace that spiritual connection has brought to their lives. Instead, he chooses to remain silent and dies during, during Mass, Easter Mass, in fact, amongst the people who loved him, who believed him to be a holy man. He died not for their sins so that they might enter heaven one day, because he doesn't believe it exists, but for their peace of mind here on earth so that they might live meaningful lives. And this is what I found to be so interesting about existentialism. It provides a different way of looking at things, and sometimes that outlook is bleak. But it takes something that might happen every day, or decisions that we make every day, and turns it into something interesting and complex, something commonplace, and turns it into something that will turns the gears in your head until you can't think straight. And that might sound kind of unpleasant, but there's nothing more life-affirming than a little bit of existential mental exhaustion. So, do I have any time left? Because I got existential Rafiki if you guys want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> no time left? Uh, Thank don't. you, Brianna. <laughs>